This is our final lesson in chapter 13, so lesson 13.4 on heat technology. We have four objectives. You should be able to analyze several kinds of heating systems, describe how a heat engine works, explain how a refrigerator keeps food cold, and list some effects of heat technology on the environment. So we're going to look at a picture in just a second. We have uh, two examples of heating systems, a hot water heating system and a warm air heating system. So in the hot water heating system, the high specific heat of water makes it useful for heating systems. Air cannot hold as much energy as water can, but warm air heating systems are used in many homes and offices in the United States. These are generally referred to as heat pumps. So here we have a hot water heating system. You can see that an expansion tank handles the increased volume of the heated water. Here's your hot water heater. And it has a pump that pumps it up. Air heated by radiators circulates in the room by convection currents. Remember, we talked about convection. And then, of course, you need some way, some exhaust for the smoke to get out. And this would be a warm air heating system. So in this, you have your furnace and the fan and a duct that's going to run up and a vent somewhere in your house or in that room that's going to allow that warm air to be circulated by convection currents again and then it's going to filter back in and back down and go back and go through that same process all again. Come back and watch this Eureka video please. So insulation. This is a material that reduces the transfer of thermal energy because remember in every energy conversion there's a little bit of thermal energy that's given off, so it's kind of wasted. So when insulation is used in walls, ceilings, and floors, less heat passes into or out of the building. You can kind of tell in the winter which houses have really good insulation in the attic and which ones don't. Now, not the ones that have sun shining on them. I mean, it would have to be two that would be kind of in the same type of uh, elements and location. Um, so if you have in the same location where both are getting the same amount of sunlight and one roof, all of the snow melts off quicker than the other roof, then that is a sign to show you that that roof doesn't have as much insulation in the attic as the one that the snow stays on. So the one that the snow stays on, that house would be more energy efficient. We've talked about solar heating. This is heat from the sun, because we know that the sun gives off a huge amount of heat. So solar heating systems use this energy to heat houses and buildings. But again, you've got to have some way to store it up. And the sun has to be shining. So it's great. It's expensive to get started. And then you have some drawbacks later on as well. But if you can afford it, it's a great way. So you have some type of solar collector. A lot of times people will put those on the roof on the house. Sometimes you'll see them out in a field nearby. And active sol solar heating systems often consist of solar cell collectors, a network of pipes, pumps, and a fan, and a water storage tank. Passive solar heating systems utilize thick walls and large windows that face the south. That way they can absorb the sun's radiation, absorb its heat energy. Heat engines. So a machine that transforms heat into mechanical energy, or basically work. Heat engines burn fuel through a process called combustion and you have external combustion engines and internal combustion engines. You're going to see an example of this in a second. 
but an external combustion engine, an example of that would just be a simple steam engine. An internal combustion engine would be like the engine in your car. So fuel is burned inside the engine. The fuel that we typically use is gasoline gas, which is burned inside the cylinders. And the cylinders go through a series of steps in burning the fuel, thereby giving the car the energy it needs to move. So here we have um, the expanding, this is a simple steam machine. The expanding steam enters the cylinder from one side. The steam does work on the piston, forcing the piston to move. As the piston moves, um, or the steam exit the cylinder through the exhaust outlet and then steam enters the, uh, through the open valve. So you've got this constant exchange of energy that's occurring to allow this to happen. And then as the piston moves to the other side, the second valve opens up and steam enters. The steam does work on the piston and it moves back. The motion of the piston then turns the flywheel. So very simple technology, and this is how the very first steam engines were built. Cooling system. Have you ever thought about how your refrigerator works? <laughs> well, basically, it's used to transfer the thermal energy out of the refrigerator so that it feels cooler. Most require electrical energy to do the work of cooling. The electrical energy used by a device is called uh, the compressor. The compressor does the work of compressing the refrigerant. And a refrigerant is a gas that has a boiling point below room temperature. So this allows it to condense easily. There's a brain pop that you need to go back and watch on refrigerators, complete the quiz. And then here is the image of what is going on inside of the refrigerator. So the compressor uses electrical energy to compress that refrigerant gas. This compression increases the pressure and the temperature of the gas. You've got all these coils on the back of your refrigerator. The hot gas flows through the condenser coils on the outside of the refrigerator. The gas condenses into a liquid transferring some of its thermal energy to the coils. That's why it's represented in red. So this would be your area of high pressure. When the liquid passes through the expansion valve, it goes from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. As a result, the temperature of the liquid decreases. And as the cold liquid refrigerant moves through the evaporating coils, it absorbs the thermal energy from the refrigerator compartment, making the inside of the refrigerator cold. As a result, the temperature of the refrigerant increases and it changes into a gas. And then the gas is returned to the compressor and the cycle repeats itself over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And that's how your refrigerator works. One of the negative effects of excess thermal energy is called thermal pollution. So basically the excessive heating of a body of water. You typically have thermal pollution occurring near large power plants, which are typically located near bodies of water because they need the water uh, to help cool the plants down and to help the plant run. So we need to be careful with this, and we may need to take care of our environment. But heat energy and heat technology are all things that we're still trying to become better at, to become more efficient. So this concludes uh, Lesson 13.4 and also Chapter 13.